thank you for that lovely introduction. I've never been introduced by three people, but I like it, and I think I'll recommend it when I go out to speak. Uh, in 1972, one day after the Munich Olympics, the massacre at the Munich Olympics, I arrived in Moscow on a mission to visit refuseniks, those Jews who had applied for permission to leave the Soviet Union for family reunification and had been refused. They were called refuseniks. This was the beginning of the refusenik movement. Uh, one day I was walking, it was time of Rosh Hashanah, and one evening I was walking with a very prominent, well-known refusenik, and we were being followed by a KGB car. And it wasn't that we were so smart to uh, see the KGB car, but the car wanted to make it known to us that we were being followed. I asked my uh, host, the, the refusenik, how do you deal with this constant surveillance? And he said, many ways, including humor. So I said, humor, give me an example. And he told me the following joke. Word goes out in Moscow that a store is going to receive a shipment of shoes. And those of you who know, know the late unlamented Soviet Union know that consumer goods were in very short supply. People didn't care what style the shoes were, what size the shoes were. They wanted to get shoes so they could buy them and then barter them for other things. Uh, so it was a January day, uh, and the shoes were going to arrive the next night. Early in the evening before, people line up. They stay there overnight. The line grows and grows. By early in the morning, people are frozen solid. It's time for the store to open. The manager comes out and says, we're not going to open yet but I see from the line there are not going to be enough shoes for everyone. Jews go home, no Jew is getting shoes. So the Jews leave and go home. A few hours later he comes out, there are not going to be enough shoes for everyone. All non-communist party members go home. So the non-communist party members go home. So it goes through the day, there are not going to be enough shoes. All non-veterans of the Great War, World War II, go home. Finally, five, six in the afternoon, people, these people have been in online close to 24 hours, frozen solid. All that's left are a group of uh, medal-wearing, you know, veterans of the war who had won the great highest medals. They're the only ones left online. The owner comes, the owner, the manager of the store comes out and says they're not going going to be enough, they're not going to be any shoes for anyone, everyone go home. So as two of these metal bedecked veterans of the war, loyal Communist Party members walk away from the store, one says to the other, those Jews, they have all the luck. <laughs> the absurdity of such, of such a statement is clear to you but it reflects the absurdity of anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is a form of prejudice. Think of the word prejudice. Prejudge. Don't confuse me with the facts. I've made up my mind. It is utterly ridiculous, as is any prejudice. But what is anti-Semitism? Some Jews and I think sometimes they're right. They say, I can't define it, but just like Potter Stewart said in his famous Supreme Court decision about uh, uh, pornography, I, may, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. We have, just like some people have gay dar and some people have other, we have anti-Semitism dar. We can know it, we know it when we see it. Another definition often given of anti-Semitism is someone who hates Jews more than is absolutely necessary. <laughs> now, it sounds amusing, but it's really true. I may hate you because you're an obnoxious person or because I don't know, you know, for whatever reason, I hate you. But if I hate you one iota more because you are a Jew, that's anti-Semitism. So too, if it were a black person, if you hated them one iota more because they're black, that's racism. But actually, there is a way of defining of anti-Semitism and identifying it. We look for three characteristics. One, some reference to money, some reference to financial power. Two, some reference to intellect or smarts, but not used positively, used maliciously, cunning nefarious, using it to their advantage, and three, a power to 
punch above their weight. Small in number, but they control whatever it might be that the anti-Semite is talking about. And I, as I said earlier, anti-Semitism is a form of prejudice, but it's different. It's different from other prejudices, certainly, let's say, in comparison to racism. The racist punches down. The racist says, if that person of color comes into our building, if their kids move into our schools, whatever it might be, there goes the neighborhood, there goes the school. They look at them with contempt. They're lesser than. They will take us down. The anti-Semite, in contrast, says those Jews may be fewer in number, but if they get involved, they will take over. They will use their smarts. They will use their power to hurt us. The anti-Semite, who is generally the same person as the racist, punches up so that People of color are, and many, and, and Muslims and others, the, that prejudice, they're to be feared. The Jew is to be feared and to be loathed. The Jew is to be feared for what they might do to us. It is a conspiracy theory of massive proportions. Today we see anti-Semitism from the right, we see it from the left, we see it from Islamist extremists. And one of the most useless, time-consuming and wasting debates I often hear, particularly within the Jewish community, is which is worse, anti-Semitism from the left or from the right? They're both bad and they present in different ways. And if you look at only one side, I just recently uh, described a, a person of the left as the Moshe Dayan of anti-Semitism. He only saw it on the right, but the people on the right who only see it on the left. Um, Even Holocaust denial can be understood as a form of anti-Semitism. Let's say you were to get on a plane. And I get on planes, I never talk to the person next to me. I came back from Germany yesterday, nine and a half hours in complete silence. I don't want to talk. Because, you know, the, oh, about the Holocaust, tell me about it. I don't, you know, if at worst they're a nudnik. At best, you know, they could be much. It's a long trip to have a nudnik asking you questions. But let's say you sat next down next to a denier. And you asked them, what do you do? And they said, oh, I write about the Holocaust. And let's say you were tabla rasa about the history of the Holocaust. They, oh, it's a terrible thing. I don't know much about it. And they were to say to you, oh, you should know. You'll be glad to know it didn't happen. And they go into their harangue. The natural question you would ask at the end of their harangue is, but why? Why would the Jews have made up this story? What's in it for them? And the answer, you would say, if you ask someone, what did the Jews get out of the Holocaust? And it's hard to say, we got out of anything, we got something out of something that killed one out of every three Jews on the face of the earth. But the answer often given is the state of Israel and reparations. Now, the state of, answer of the state of Israel is not really correct, because there would have been something. There would have been some entity e without the Holocaust, but that's the perception. And reparations, of course, is a fancy word for money. There you have an answer. The p power of the Jews, the power of the Jews to get Germany to acknowledge a wrong they didn't commit, to get the Allies to have the Nuremberg trials. The small group in number, but look what they were able to engineer, and why did they do it? In order to enrich themselves. In other words, to the anti-Semite, it makes sense. And today we see a resurgence of anti-Semitism, and of course, as you, all of you know, but also of Holocaust denial, not the hardcore Holocaust denial, which is what I fought in court, but more softcore Holocaust denial. Wasn't so bad. Why do we always hear about the Holocaust? Why are the Jews always going on about the Holocaust? Why, about, why this genocide? I'll tell you why. As I mentioned a, day, a moment earlier, in the space of 1941 through middle of 1945, actually end of 1944, one out of every three Jews on the face of the earth was murdered. Two out of every three Jews on the European continent was murdered. 
and these murders continued. Take the Jew it wasn't just on the European continent. The island of Rhodes, one of the oldest Jewish communities, probably as old as the Roman Jewish community. When were they deported? Six weeks after the landing at Normandy. In other words, the war is already, it's not yet at its end, it's gonna go on for another close to a year, but, but they're so desperate to kill every Jew they can. There is a demented quality to anti-Semitism, which makes it an even greater danger. And as I said, we see it on the right, and we see it on the left. On the right, think about Charlottesville and the people marching in Charlottesville chanting, Jews will not replace us. What did they mean by that? They meant that they, there is a belief on the right, not everyone on the right certainly, but certainly on the far right, and those closer into the center as well, um, of white Christian replacement theory that there is a plan afoot for black people and brown people to invade the European continent, to invade our, our, uh, the, our country from the south. But these people, the racist says, punching down, they're not smart enough to do this on their own. They're being manipulated. Someone is controlling this. Who is it? The Jew. Jews will not replace us. What was the killer in Pittsburgh yelling as he was being brought down by the SWAT team to the people he, was, he had killed and those who he hadn't yet, or he still wanted to kill? You won't destroy the white race. What about on the left? On the left, you get something a little different. You get a structural anti-Semitism. We see it in the British Labour Party. We see it in this country as well, even amongst some members of Congress, where they look upon the Jew, they see a white, pe white people, even though those on the right don't see us as white, and they see all of us as people of privilege, and I'm sure everyone in this room knows that that's a wrong perception of Jews, that there are many Jews who are not of privilege. But they say these are people with power. If you have power, you can't be a victim of prejudice. And me, as a liberal person, I couldn't be a purveyor of prejudice. So it's a phony charge. They don't take it seriously. What do we have to do? We have to demand of the world, A, take this seriously. We have to demand of the world, see this as a human rights abuse, as, as you see all other human rights abuses. What, what must we do? We must become the unwelcome guests at the dinner party. When you hear, paraphrasing the TSA, when you hear something, you must say something. Even if it's a joke, because these jokes aren't funny. And every genocide begins with words. There is no genocide that began with action. Whether you're talking about the Holocaust, whether you're talking about the Armenian Genocide, whether you're talking about Rwanda, it all begins with words. The time to stop it is when they're just words, not much later. What must we do also, and sometimes this is hard to do, we can't fight one-ism without fighting all other isms. We've got to stand up and say it's ethically wrong, it's morally wrong, because if it may start with the Jews, it doesn't end with the Jews. It may start with other groups. It will reach us. Tonight, we come to honor the partisans among us, the memory of partisans, the contribution of partisans, many of whose names we'll never know. On some level, they were the lucky ones. When I teach my courses on the history of the Holocaust, and I get to my, the section on, on resistance and uprising, whether we're talking about the Warsaw Ghetto or Vilna or the many other ghetto uprisings, or, and of course the Warsaw Ghetto uprising was the first armed uprising against the Nazis anywhere on the European continent. Not the first armed Jewish armed uprising against the Nazis anywhere on the European continent. I look at my students, 18, 19, 20 years old, and I can see Jew, non-Jew, it doesn't matter what religion, what ethnicity, what color, they were all thinking, if I was there, that's who I would have been. But we know it's not that simple. Would you have left the ghetto if you had an older, a parent who was at 45, was considered old? 
and you knew if you escaped, they would be then deported. We don't know what we would have done. And we know so many who would have wanted to be able to pick up a gun and fight, or to somehow sabotage, to say we are not going down quietly, we're not going down silently. We honor those who were lucky enough to do this. And on some level, I have to tell you, even though I was involved in this long legal battle, which ultimately went on for about six years, and, and sapped my energy and took all my attention, and wasn't fun. In the end, we won, and there was a movie and all that. That's nice, but I can tell you, it wasn't fun. I would have much rather it never happened. But I have to say that on some level, even after writing this book and spending three years in the sewers of anti-Semitism, writing about contemporary anti-Semitism and having pe pe spent the past seven months since it came out, traveling worldwide, I just came back from Germany yesterday, I go back again in 10 days, I go to Norway, et cetera, talking about this topic. I have to tell you that some level, I feel blessed. It seems a strange thing to say but I feel blessed because I have had the chance and I have the chance to stand up to those who, will, who hate us. I've spoken to so many Jews who feel so frustrated, what can I do? I feel like on some level, very small, I'm not comparing myself in any way, but I feel blessed like I think many of those partisan fighters must have felt blessed that they could stand up and do something. We all, in our way, must stand up and do something. You're here tonight, you're supporting education, that's one thing. Speak out. Ask, tell people they must take this seriously, whether it's coming from the right, whether it's coming from the left. And the final point, and with this I close, at the same time that we make this our battle, and we say we're, we're not gonna let this go down silently, we also have to protect against something else. Last chapter of my book I call Oi versus Joy. And we have to be careful at this moment when so many of us are worried and so many of us are concerned about this threat, of letting the threat of what others might do to us become the defining force of who we are as Jews of letting us become Jew as object, what is done to Jews, as opposed to Jew as subject, what Jews do. We are not Jews because the, over so many generations, as we say in the Haggadah, Om lechaloteinu, they're those who've risen up to try to destroy us. We're Jews despite their efforts, despite the efforts of the National Socialists, the Nazis, and so many others to do us in, we remain Jews because of the heritage we have, of all we have given to the world, of, of what it is that is inside of us, that, that pintle yid, as some of your ancestors might have said, that little bit of that Jew. We are so much more than victims. We have given so much to the world, and you are here today to say we remember their contribution, we teach about it so that we can, can uh, our generation, next generations, the many young people we have seen up here tonight, which has been a thrill to watch, will continue to the give to the world because of the joys of Judaism, despite the efforts of the world to harm us. Thank you very much. <laughs>